Being in a relationship with a narcissist is fucking heartbreaking. Giving your heart to somebody only to have them break you over the coals. And by the time you're back on your feet, you have no idea what just happened. Wondering how you got here and how in the world do you get back to what was. Because what nobody wants to tell you is that dating a narcissist is fucking amazing until it's not. But I want you to know, how do you know if you're dealing with a narcissist and how would you spot one so that you can avoid falling into the trap? According to Psych Central, approximately 5% of the population has narcissistic personality disorder. While social media will tell you that anybody who's got an ego is charming, entitled, or arrogant is a narcissist. So what is it that separates somebody who's a little bit more controlling or egotistical from an actual narcissist? Well, if you stick around for the entire video, I'm going to tell you five really important things that you need to understand about narcissism that will not only help you understand and identify a narcissist and avoid the pain of going through something incredibly toxic. But at the end, I'm going to give you three tests to run to make sure that the person that you're dealing with isn't setting you up for an uncontrolled roller coaster ride. Now the first thing I need to address is the cost of dealing with a narcissist. If you've experienced one, especially as a child, it likely shaped or entirely warped your sense of identity. And if you've been with a narcissist in adulthood, well, I don't have to tell you how that experience stole you from yourself. What's worse is after dealing with a narcissist, you've probably got so much guilt and shame and you feel bad for discussing the toxic situation that you found yourself in. And because they've beaten you down slowly over time like death by a thousand paper cuts, you look in the mirror and you see someone that you no longer recognize. Nobody talks about how being with a narcissist stole your ambition, your focus, your drive, your passions, and your zest for life, leading you to feel like your time and the light that was within you was entirely wasted and you can't get that back. Meanwhile, the narcissist just kept on thriving. And because they're so captivating and charming publicly, nobody believes you when you tell them what it was like behind closed doors. What I need to emphasize here is that there is a cost to a narcissist on someone else's life. The cost is creating a person that no longer believes in themselves. The cost is giving up on your path of education or never pursuing a dream that you once had. So we never got to see the work, the product, the art, or the magic that you would have created, that you should have created. Not to mention not getting to be who you wanted to be as a mother, as a wife, or as a friend. It's the person who knew what they wanted to be. They had a very strong sense of identity and they ended up choosing something else because they knew the only way that they could be loved was to be what that person demanded of them. It's the person who was an absolutely glorious human being, lovely, empathetic, funny, kind, and warm, but feels damaged after years of being told, you're not enough, you're selfish, you're greedy, you're foolish, it's your fault you're the problem. And they get into a relationship after relationship that duplicates that theme, never getting real compassionate, intimate love that they deserve. Because after years of narcissistic abuse, they don't believe they deserve it. And that is just the top of the iceberg. Which brings me to my next point, the question of whether narcissism is a personality disorder or a normal personality trait involves two separate issues. The first is the one that most people will consider when questioning what narcissism is. Is it something somebody does or doesn't have? Or is it a function that operates on a spectrum? Meaning, is there variance between somebody who's a little bit narcissistic moderately narcissistic and extremely narcissistic and everything in between. Now, it doesn't seem contradictory to think that narcissism operates on a spectrum even in healthy, non-disordered individuals, but there is a point in which it becomes extreme and incredibly toxic. However, identifying that specific point when it becomes toxic or extreme is something that's contentious within the dialogue. In my experience working with different psychologists, it seems to be that they agree that narcissism occurs on a spectrum and the severity or presence of narcissism can function on subclinical levels. I think it's best understood as a dynamic of different personality traits that exists on a continuum. And at the high end of the continuum, it can become incredibly disordered. So extreme in fact, that it interferes with normal healthy psychological functioning and is entirely toxic to the people that encounter them. Now, there's another really important element that we have to address, which is what exact personality traits are we considering when we're looking at narcissism? Because it's so complex and personality really is difficult to measure, there's lots of different dimensions that we have to look at underneath this. Most people seem to agree that grandiosity, for example, or believing that you're better than everybody else, entitlement, believing that you deserve special treatment, and arrogance are central facets of narcissism. And these traits are key whether we're talking about narcissism as a clinical disorder or as a personality trait. If somebody is highly confident and assertive but not grandiose or entitled, are they considered narcissistic? This question I bring because it is critical when we look at the research around narcissism, but the inclusion of these things can skew some of the findings. And if I'm being completely honest, 
it can make narcissism look less severe than it actually is. So my personal take on narcissism is a more specific criteria being focused on is better aligned with what we're looking at when it comes to the toxicity of dealing with a narcissist. Focusing on the core traits like grandiosity, manipulation, entitlement, arrogance, and gaslighting, but not including more normative traits like confidence and assertiveness, provides much more clarity around the definition of what we're talking about when we're talking about a narcissist. More importantly, it actually categorizes true narcissists from everybody being a narcissist. Which brings me to my next point. Are there different kinds of narcissists? What makes narcissism so complex is that it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. It comes in its own different flavors. And this can make it really difficult if you're trying to figure out if you're dating a narcissist while your friend might be dating a narcissist, but the way that they present themselves or the way that their narcissism manifests is entirely different. When we talk about narcissism, we tend to think of the most obvious type, the grandiose narcissist. Grandiose narcissists are arrogant, pretentious, and lack empathy. They have high levels of self-importance and are constantly seeking attention. Interestingly to note though, they tend to be highly successful people because while they have these grandiose dreams, they also pair that with work ethic to make these dreams come true. And they hustle to turn these fantasies into reality. Vulnerable narcissists, on the other hand though, are more passive aggressive and they feel victimized. They are sullen, resentful, and often feel aggrieved and tend to have this failure to launch element about them. These individuals feel entitled to their dreams coming true, but don't feel like they should have to work for anything. They often struggle with social anxiety and tend to lack the charisma and charm that their grandiose counterparts have. Now, malignant narcissists are the most severe and harmful type. They exhibit the standard narcissistic traits, but also engage in heavy-handed manipulation, coercion, and exploitation. These relationships can be incredibly unsettling, sometimes involving or threatening physical violence. And that threat of physical violence is always kind of lingering in the atmosphere around a malignant narcissist. Now, another form of narcissism is the communal narcissism. Narcissist. And in this model, they're still motivated by all of the other things. Attention, admiration, praise, and they also have a lack for empathy. That is a consistent underpinning of any type of narcissist. But the way that these people get their admiration and validation is through being perceived as a hero or savior. So these people go out into the world and do these good things, but frame it as, look at me, I'm doing all this great stuff, I'm helping the people. And they very well may be doing these things. Raising money, supporting a nonprofit, on a weekend, cleaning the beach in their bikini making sure they look great so they can post it on the gram you get what i'm saying but it's all a form of driving a certain perception because that's how they get their validation however they can get very angry when they don't receive the anticipated amount of validation by doing their good deeds and this can make them very angry and very resentful the fifth kind of narcissism is something that we term as the self-righteous narcissist and they tend to be morally rigid financially controlling and incredibly judgmental they'll say things like i work really hard to have all the things I have and you don't have shit because you don't work that hard. They're always going to take a dig at why you aren't where you want to be. And when I say they're rigid, I mean incredibly rigid. Like if you have dinner at 7 p.m. and you're stuck in traffic, even if you message them and let them know you're going to be a little bit late, by the time you show up at 7.15, they're the type of people that would be like, no, dinner was at 7. You're late you're not getting dinner. And you're like, what the F? But because they're so morally righteous and very consistent and loyal and they follow through on their commitments, they're seen or perceived by the world as being incredibly loyal people. And oftentimes they're very religious. So they're viewed as the pillar of their religious community. And because they live within these moralistic standards, they tend to be praised for the status or pedestal that they've placed themselves on. And this is their source of supply. While behind closed doors, the people that are closest to them suffer from their level of cruelty that the rest of their community doesn't ever see. And they have absolutely no tolerance for the fact that sometimes life doesn't go very well for other people and it's kind of nice to give them a helping hand. And the final form of narcissism is something that we would call neglectful narcissism. And these are the people who will literally view other human beings as instrumental to them getting their outcome goal. So they won't even notice you if you walk into the same room as them unless there's something that they wanna get from you. So the people in these relationships feel like they're completely ignored, dismissed, not even seen as if, well, you're not useful to me right now, so I'm not even going to pretend you exist. It almost feels contemptuous in a way, like I'm above needing to deal with you. I don't need to talk to you. I don't need anything from you. And people tend to believe this is only the rich and wealthy people, but that would be incorrect. There are people in normal, middle to low income family households with parents or siblings who are like, um, are you talking to me? Cause I'm not listening to what you have to say. I literally 
don't have time for this. Now, there's one more bit that's important information that I have to touch on here, which is that narcissism does not discriminate based on gender. Both men and women can exhibit traits from any of the narcissistic subtypes. However, societal norms and expectations can influence how narcissism manifests in women in comparison to men. Which brings me to my next point. Who are narcissists actually attracted to? The misconception around narcissists is that they're attracted to doormats, which couldn't be more far from the truth. But first, I wanna to touch on the concept of attraction in the first place. Most people are attracted to other people who resemble familiarity with themselves. Maybe that's similar interests or passions, backgrounds, etc. And or people who have character traits that we admire or envy. So when it comes to why narcissistic people are attractive, well, that's somewhat obvious. You can see that confidence, conviction, charm, and charisma are all really enticing qualities, but the underpinning as to why they are attracted to other people tends to come from the lens of, well, what makes me look best? For example, if we're talking about a vulnerable narcissist, they tend to be attracted to people who have similar insecurities as they do. And this can also lead to way more emotionally distressing relationships. Grandiose narcissists, on the other hand, have this inflated sense of self-importance. And so they will seek people who enhance their own image. And this tends to lead to way less connection in the relationship. And they treat people essentially like they're an accessory. Like I noted earlier, a big misconception is that narcissists go for the weak but that's not true. They actually prefer to target somebody who is more strong-willed and who has talents or characteristics that they admire. And they do that because they have a belief that it also allows them to shine too. Now, the screwed up part about that is whatever trait that a narcissist is attracted to that brings them to seek out this individual, they tend to take that trait, turn it around and completely destroy it because they are also the type of people who feel really empowered by tearing other people down. Some narcissists may go for some types of people and try to completely dismantle them as a reflection of their own low self-esteem. But for others, there's joy found in creating chaos. They want people who will validate their feelings, overlook their flaws, and they want somebody who isn't likely to leave them during narcissistic abuse. So while narcissists will seek out people who tend to be strong-willed, they're also looking for a few chinks in the armor, which means ultimately, their victim will blame themselves for the abuse that they experience. These could be people who have trauma as a part of their past, have a string of bad relationships, or have an attachment style that makes them incredibly vulnerable. What's also really important to note is they tend to have severely unrealistic expectations for their partner, and they put them on this pedestal. They also have unstable object constancy, which frequently leads them to find dissatisfaction once the initial spark has run out in the relationship. And they tend to judge and devalue their partner once they see the more human side of their ethics. Essence. Think of a narcissist more like a sprinter, not an endurance runner. It's hot and heavy all in from the beginning and then it burns out towards the end. Now, why would a narcissist be attracted to a strong-willed type A type of person? You might be wondering, so I'm gonna break that down. And this is ultimately because type A people tend to give and do more than they receive. Some people who are extremely type A really enjoy problem solving and also have an aversion to people doing them favors, no matter how small they are. And that's really good bait for a narcissist because most narcissists tend to be freeloaders. And because type A people tend to be more left brain or logical, they will aim to find an explanation for everything. So this can end up in a perfect storm of toxic relationship for a narcissist. Because if you're type A like me, you'll want to understand why somebody was acting that way. What was the cause for their impulsive and reactive behavior? Why do they go immediately into rage? Or why do they assume that you're doing something that you're not? Now, the problem with this is that you're not actually the problem, they are. But they will never take responsibility ability for that. They're the type of people where the goal post is always moving, but you'll realize that it doesn't matter how perfectly you do things, how receptive you are to feedback, how adamant you are about wanting the relationship to work and being willing to change. You could do things perfectly relative to the last time you were reprimanded and the goal post will move and that will still be wrong. And this will keep you busy with their smoke and mirrors that you'll overlook that the actual problem is the narcissist. Now you've probably heard the dynamic between empaths and narcissists. So I want to touch on that attraction here. These people are drawn to one another because an empath has a lot of compassion and understanding to give, while a narcissist thrives on the idea of somebody worshiping them. And people with high levels of empathy tend to put the blame on themselves. And this dynamic suits the narcissist just fine because as their mask starts to slip, their partner puts more and more and more and more effort into the relationship. And it's really hard for a true empath to wrap their mind around the idea that somebody else could just not have any levels of empathy. And so they tend to believe that love is enough. And if they just love somebody hard enough, it will be enough and everything will be okay. Now, as a personal anecdote here, that was me. 
I actually got into clinical psychology studying cluster B personality disorders because of my ex and all of the minefield and mental gymnastics I had to go through to try to understand how somebody could behave that way. But if you're somebody who's like this, I just wanna add a personal note here. It's not your fault and you didn't deserve that. And unfortunately, because you're not wired that way, you will never be able to understand it no matter how many books you read, no matter how much research you do, because you don't think the way that they do. Now, a last note on relationships and attraction is understanding that a narcissist is truly going to seek out control. They love to feel like they have power over their partner and their partner tends to be an object, not necessarily a human. And if they can get them to submit and obey to every single request, and to them, sometimes it's more entertaining than anything else. They find joy in being able to exercise exercise control over somebody who had this really great life and be the hand that's a part of it falling entirely apart. That part of the journey is what makes it so diabolical and it's also why they enjoy it. Now we have to talk about some of the plays that they run and in this section I'm going to talk about the narcissistic abuse cycle. When you're in this, by the second stage you are grasping onto the better days, wishing and praying and hoping that if you can just be good enough, you'll get that back. The narcissistic abuse cycle is a manipulation pattern. It's used to control their partners and get them to start to question what reality is. The cycle starts by idealizing the person and then devaluing them before rejecting and discarding them, only to start the cycle all over again when they move into hoovering. Each phase of the cycle keeps the victim confused, dependent, and ultimately aims to leave them trapped within this vicious cycle. So I wanna break down the first phase, which is idealization. This is where the relationship is brand new, or if you've already gone through the cycle, then this is where it begins again. And this is where everything feels great and wonderful. It's exciting, phenomenal. I mean, they'll take you on this love bombing ideal where they just do everything that is over the top and it feels like a fairy tale story. Yet, if you are a female who's enamored by that, it can be incredibly, captivating. This is also referred to in a normal relationship as the honeymoon stage, but just think about that on steroids. This is where the narcissistic partner will put you on a pedestal and make you feel perfect and impossible for you to have any ounce of wrongdoing. Now at first this can feel really nice, but also pay attention to the inner feelings that you have because it will become overpowering and incredibly overwhelming. Now to give this a little texture, I want to give a list of certain behaviors that tend to be included in this phase. Number one, love bombing. Number two, giving a lot of attention to their partner. Number three, these grandiose gestures. Number four, elaborate gifts and dates. Number five, future faking or concepts known as talking about things in the future that they wanna do with you, getting married, starting a family, buying a house, etc. They also tend to have a lack of boundaries here. They want intimacy and they will almost demand that you put down your walls and share all of your vulnerabilities with them. They will also aim to start to isolate their partner out of the name of love and protection, of course. They will also pressure or quickly move to accelerate intimacy with you and they have this sense of ownership that you belong to them now after the honeymoon stage wears off we move into stage two devaluation this is where you formed some type of routine that you guys have established together that seems to be consistent now most couples will lean into this and problem solve together to build a deeper connection but in a narcissistic relationship this is where they start to make digs and pull you off of that pedestal that they placed you on this is where they'll start to put you down make fun of you point out the flaws that you have and they will use physical or verbal abuse and or physical intimacy as a weapon. And if you try to confront them about this, they will always play the victim. Narcissists are allergic to any level of responsibility. And anytime they've done something or acted outside of what would be respectful or normal or anything that's tolerable, you made them do it. It's your fault. You're the problem, remember? And this will only be thrown back in your face and they will continue to devalue you as a partner. Some of the behaviors might look like constantly putting you down, attempting to change you as the partner, increasing their criticisms and insults towards you. Narcissistic gaslighting, which I'm sure we're very familiar with by this time. Physical threats, lack of communication, stonewalling, an increased violation of boundaries, increasing the strength of their control over you, and withholding physical, emotional, or sexual intimacy. Which moves us into stage three, rejection. Now in a healthy relationship, disagreements and overcoming those by problem solving with one another and effective communication is what moves the relationship forward. But in a narcissistic relationship, the rejection phase is when they blame every single problem within the dynamic of your relationship on you. And if they are no longer getting their supply filled, 
filled or their ego boosted by your presence, they will slowly discard you. Because these people aren't truly interested in love, commitment, and security, they will complete their cycle of abuse and move on to the next form of supply. Or if they can't find another form of supply, they'll move into the next phase of the cycle. In this stage, stage three, rejection, it may include some of the following behaviors feelings of contempt and rage, betraying the relationship, invalidating their partner's emotions, placing the blame of everything on their partner, playing the victim, physical, emotional, or verbal abuse, and ending the relationship temporarily or permanently in order to continue the cycle of abuse. Which brings me to the final stage in the narcissistic abuse cycle, hoovering or re-engagement. This is where they're going to try to reconnect or reconcile their relationship between you two. And this comes after a period of withdrawal. And this is where they're trying to replenish the supply by finding another source of it. Now this can come in many different forms, engaging in love bombing tactics, spreading rumors, exacerbating crises within their lives. And these efforts are intended to suck people back in. And this stage can create immense distress. And this can make it really challenging, especially as a highly empathetic person who once probably truly loved this individual despite how they actually felt about you. And this makes it really challenging to disengage and completely move on. Some of the behaviors in this stage can look like repeatedly reaching out, apologizing, which they don't actually mean by the way, making promises to change their behavior if you just come back, threatening to hurt themselves due to the emotional pain of you leaving or this relationship falling apart, sending expensive or thoughtful presents, lying or exaggerating about things that are happening in their life, having other people reach out to you to tell you about how they feel about you to pull you back in, showing up unexpectedly at your work or at your home, and claiming to accidentally text you or call you. Now, this brings me to my next point. You might be wondering, especially if you're like me, who's been in a situation like this, and all you want to do is try to understand because you think that maybe by understanding how somebody could behave like this or be like this, it might give you a sense of peace. So what is it that makes a narcissist? There are a few things that I'm gonna break down that contribute to the personality dimensions of narcissism and what on an environmental position or genetic factors contribute to developing narcissism. There is some evidence that narcissistic traits can be genetically inherited, and this may predispose somebody to developing narcissistic tendencies. And when it comes to temperament, inborn personality traits, such as sensitivity, moodiness, or a natural tendency towards aggression or assertiveness can contribute to the development development overall of narcissism. But there are other things developmentally that also contribute to this, such as early childhood experiences. When it comes to parental behavior, remember we all learn by how we're treated and we tend to normalize whatever's happening in the environment that we were raised within. So if their parent was over pampering or excessively critical, both of these can contribute to narcissistic development. Overindulgence of things or not having to work to receive certain things can lead to a level of arrogance and entitlement, while also elevating a child's sense of self-importance, while over criticism can lead to fragile self-esteem in a young child and a compensatory mechanism for a need of admiration. Growing up in a household where caregivers lack empathy or are entirely emotionally unavailable can hinder a child's ability to develop empathy and a healthy self-image. Inconsistent or conditional praise or criticism can lead to a lot of confusion around where somebody finds their self-worth. If a child's achievements are always praised, but their failures are harshly criticized, they may learn to overvalue success and external validation. Now, environmentally, we have to look at some of the underpinnings that contribute to this as well. Media and cultural norms that glorify fame, wealth, and physical appearance can also contribute to the manifestation of narcissism. Now, one important thing that I think we have to cover in this section is attachment styles. An insecure attachment style, often resulting from inconsistent or neglectful parenting, can contribute to narcissistic traits. And this includes both anxious and avoidant attachment styles. And if these individuals also lack trust because of their attachment styles, they'll have extreme difficulty in forming healthy relationships. And without the ability to cultivate trust in a relationship, this can lead to a reliance on narcissistic behaviors overall. Now, the last thing that I have to discuss is childhood trauma. Experiences of neglect, abuse, or significant loss during childhood can lead to the development of narcissistic traits as a coping mechanism. And emotional trauma, such as being frequently shamed or humiliated, can also contribute to the development of narcissistic traits. And this allows the child to reclaim a sense of power and importance. Now, when we look at personality traits, because I love personality dimensions, we wanna look at the personality traits on the continuum and how they manifest themselves within a narcissistic individual. Now, I'm going to break this down using the big five, which includes openness, extroversion, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and agreeableness. And the reason that I'm bringing this up and why it's so important is that narcissists tend to exhibit distinct patterns across these personality dimensions. So. 
Here's how they tend to score. When it comes to openness, this can be somewhat variable. Narcissists may score high in this category if they are oriented towards grandiosity or fantasy. However, they may score lower if they are not open to other people's opinions or tend to be more self-centered. When it comes to conscientiousness, they also seem to be a bit variable here. If it's related to achievement striving or self-discipline, they can score on the higher end. But if they perceive certain tasks to be beneath them, then they're probably not going to score higher on this category. But this is where it gets interesting, and this is where they set themselves apart. When it comes to extroversion, narcissists tend to score consistently high. They tend to be excitement-seeking and embody this superficial level of charm. It's also interesting to note that there's research that shows that they're really chaotic drivers and they tend to be aggressive on the road. If you've ever been in a car with a narcissist, you know exactly what I'm talking about. However, what's important to know is that their drive for extroversion tends to rely on the fact that they need external validation. And it's not necessarily a genuine interest in a social interaction. Now, when it comes to agreeableness, this is probably not a super big surprise to you, but they tend to score really low. They tend to be less altruistic and way more competitive. And again, they just lack empathy. They exhibit traits such as antagonism, manipulativeness, and a tendency to exploit others for their own gain. They tend to be way less cooperative and way more critical of other people. Now, lastly, we have to touch on neuroticism. And this might be somewhat surprising, but they tend to score actually pretty high. And if you've dated a narcissist, you'll know that they're impulsive and their mood swings just blow up out of nowhere. Their levels of neuroticism tend to manifest themselves in areas of anger, hostility, vulnerability, or if they're more grandiose, then it will be the underlying insecurity that drives their anxiety and depression. And they also tend to mask this with their inflated sense of self-worth. Now, this brings me to my last point and probably why you're here. What three tests can I run to see if I'm dealing with a narcissist. If you're uncertain if you are or aren't dating somebody who could be a narcissist, then I wanna make sure I leave you with some tools that you can deploy to assess this objectively. I understand this is a ton of information and education, but we don't really understand things until we see them play themselves out in reality. I'm gonna give you several different ones, pick three, and let me know how it goes. Feel free to report back in the comments. I'm sure we're all itching. Now there's something called the NPI, our Narcissistic Personality Inventory, and I'm gonna give you a way in which you can apply this from home, though this is a widely used self-reported questionnaire to measure narcissistic traits in individuals. And while this is typically used in research and clinical settings, you can adapt this to some of your personal interactions. Number one. Observe how often they talk about themselves. Narcissists tend to dominate conversations and tend to hyperfixate on their achievements or success. Pay attention. Number two, observe how they react to any level of criticism. If you give them constructive feedback or you disagree, pay attention to their response. Narcissists in particular get highly defensive and tend to get very angry. And they will also diminish your opinion and invalidate your feelings or your perspective on something. The next thing that you can run is an empathy test. Empathy, or the lack thereof, is a significant indicator of narcissistic personality traits. Watch how this individual operates or functions in social gatherings. If you go out to a restaurant, pay attention to how they treat your server. If you're out in public, pay attention to how they treat a complete stranger. A lack of empathy or consideration for other people's feelings or the inability to deploy a level of respect is a big red flag. And the last one I want you to run is called the manipulation test. Narcissists tend to engage in very manipulative behaviors with the goal to be able to control or exploit other people. But you can gauge this. And here's a few ways to do that. Number one, establish clear boundaries and see how they respond. Narcissists tend to highly resist boundaries and will guilt trip you for trying to put them in place or pressure or manipulate you into actually moving that boundary line. Number two, pay attention to their level of consistency. Like I said, a narcissist's behavior is more like a sprint to a final destination versus a steady run of endurance. They'll come in charming and attentive, but over time that will diminish. And when they start to diminish, that will reveal their true character. Now, I also wanna point out that healthy relationships will go through that, but pay attention to how drastic the shift actually is when you go from the honeymoon or love bombing phase to a sense of normalcy and routine with one another. And number three on this category of things, change plans with them. Just test the waters and see if you can actually cancel or change when that's supposed to happen. If they are highly reactive, and again, like if you have some sense of useful reason to change that, like, you know, honor that. But if they are inflexible or they get highly outraged by the fact that you have something else going on and you would dare put that before all of the effort and thought that they've done and put into to plan this thing for you, how dare you, you ungrateful, selfish human being. If they react that way, that is a red flag. 
So this is an entire video breaking down narcissism and how to know if you're dating one. And if you're interested in understanding in general how men date, then click this video below and I'll see you there. If not, fuck off. <laughs> Bye.